All right, for uh, this talk, my name is uh, Christopher Zimmer. I'm a uh, HPC systems engineer uh, with the Oak Ridge, Re uh, Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. Um, so I do a lot of stuff on the technical side um, for the procurement. I'm also involved on the acceptance teams for the messaging and burst buffer portions of, our, of Summit. Um, as <clears throat> has been mentioned, uh, the machine is coming in right now. Uh, in December, I was part of the acceptance team for the first 1,080 nodes. Uh, it, the first 1,080 nodes passed most of their acceptance, and we've uh, made those available to users uh, in early January. And so today, I'm just going to give you kind of a brief talk on actually the way the power architecture shaped the system that Summit is. And so I'm going to talk about um, some of the architectural features and how we're using some of those, and from a systems level perspective, how those are going to impact user behaviors. The title of this talk is The Impact of the Power Architecture on the Summit Supercomputer. All right, so this is the de facto who we are slide. You guys have heard it a bunch today. I'm going to go through it again just because my talk would only be five minutes without it. Um, uh, we are the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. Uh, we run flagship supercomputers for the Department of Energy. Um, our current flagship supercomputer is Titan. It is an open science supercomputer, so that means that if you are from government or academia or industry, that you can get hours on our machine. Um, or if you're just a personal user, I'm sure you could sub submit a proposal and Jack would be happy to read it. Um, access to our machines are based on a proposal process that go through primarily two programs. It is evolving, um, but right now those two programs are Insight and ALCC. Um, it's just like an NSF proposal. You write up your interesting uh, science use cases and you submit them to us. We review them, and instead of getting money back, you get hours on the machines back. Um, so then the other aspect of that is that we're a capability computing center. So I believe Jack earlier mentioned that we're a leadership computing center, and I think the terminology is in flight right now. I think historically we've been leadership, and we're, we're calling ourselves a capability center. I believe at the end of the day it means the same thing, that we target the largest science applications possible that you can't run anywhere else. So we uh, primarily, from a scheduling perspective, will prioritize jobs that run over 20% of the machine. So on Titan, those are jobs that are 4,000 nodes or greater are what we're prioritizing. Um, this contrasts to, uh, to other centers that the DOE runs, like NURSE, for instance, which are capacity centers, where they're trying to more optimize for the number of jobs that are moving through, the, through their center overall. Instead, we look at the larger jobs. As a part of the proposal process that you actually submit, you have to demonstrate that your applications can actually scale. All right, that was the, that was the standard disclaimer slide. So right now our flagship supercomputer is Titan, and we are transitioning to Summit. And so both of them are sitting on the floor at the exact, or, you know, one's, well, across the hall from each other, uh, being installed right now while the other one is, is, is operating as our production machine. So to understand how this kind of all meshes together, we have to look at where we're sitting at right now and how the machine has evolved to the next machine. So Titan is 18,688 compute nodes uh, put together in a 3D torus network. So uh, we're talking uh, a 3D torus with dimensions of 25 by 16 by 24. So that's 9,600 network points that are sitting inside of this thin node model. Titan is 27 petaflops. And it's powered through a combination of AMD Interlogo 16 core CPUs and a single Tesla K20X GPU per node. Uh, the bulk of the flops, as you can imagine, come from the NVIDIA GPU. Uh, each of the nodes has 32 gigabytes of DDR3 DRAM, and <clears throat> that's Titan. Oh, also, uh, the interconnect performance, and I don't have it listed here, is you have an injection rate from each node of 5.2 gigabytes per second. The system that we're putting on the floor now, uh, across the hall from it, is Summit, and will be, when it's fully installed, a 200 petaflop machine. 
Again, we've accepted 1,080 nodes of it, but it's gonna be roughly 4,600 nodes. I believe most of the nodes are actually in now, we just not have, have not accepted those or pulled those back in. Each summit node will contain two IBM Power9 cores, 44 cores, 512 gigabytes of DDR4 DRAM, and six Volta V100 GPUs. And so it's a pretty, pretty big jump. And so to, to kind of understand what the power architecture is bringing to this system, we have to dive, dive a little bit deeper into uh, what Titan is, um, and then you're gonna see the same figure that you know, he's been showing on Summit all day in the next one, so that we can see where we've sought to improve some of the, the gaps on, on Titan. Titan contained a single x86 processor. The DRAM bus, or the system bus, talked to DRAM at about 55 gigabytes per second. Uh, and then the GPU was sit, was sit on a PCI Gen 2 slot, a by 16 slot. By 16 slot can achieve about six gigabytes per second, theoretical. When you start throwing in PCI overheads, you have about five, sec, five gigabytes per second out to your device. This is coupled with the fact that the GPU itself has its own six gigabytes of GDDR memory that could operate at about 250 gigabytes per second. So I think it's very clear on this slide what our weakest link is and moving data into our GPUs and how painful that might be. <clears throat> this is our summit node. Just got a little bit more complicated, not too bad. Uh, the summit node will have three GPUs per Power9 socket. Uh, each of those GPUs will be connected uh, together via 50 gigabytes per second of NVLink 2. Uh, this contra contrasts with the Sierra model, which actually has four GPUs. The Sierra model actually has 75 gigabytes per second between each GPU. The two Power 9s will be connected to two banks of uh, 256 gigabytes of DRAM um, at about 135 gigabytes per second, as well as a two-port uh, Mellanox EDR HCA, uh, which, uh, well, it's connected to about 32 gigabytes per second of PCI, but it only has about 25 gigabytes per second of network injection rate. All of this, and we're also throwing in an NVMe burst buffer that's gonna be used to be able to capture checkpoint data from the system, um, and that device will operate at about six gigabytes per second or 2.2 gigabytes per second for a writes and reads. So I think it's pretty clear to you guys where I'm going with this. What does the power architecture provide that we couldn't have gotten in competing architectures today? Is the IBM architecture provides more bandwidth. In fact, it was really disappointing sitting in the keynotes this morning and watching everybody say the same thing. I was hoping to be the first. Anyways, so we're moving from 55 gigabytes per second to 270 gigabytes per second of DRAM performance, and that's stream performance. Five to 25 gigabytes per second of uh, five to 25 gigabytes per second of interconnect performance, and an aggregate 600 gigabytes per second of NVLink 2 performance. So the memory bandwidth, and this slide will be just really quick. This is just uh, a little bit about the memory bandwidth. Uh, memory bandwidth is going to come from eight channels of uh, memory bandwidth. Uh, the power architecture is one of the first to get this out there. We are starting to see this now in our ARM systems that are coming out. In fact, we just recently pulled in a new uh, Thunder X2 ARM system that will have eight channels of memory bandwidth available, but coupled with the power of the Power9 processor, this is still a more attractive system. One thing I would like to point out is I keep on talking about 135 gigabytes per second of performance to DRAM. That is actually from the measured performance from the stream benchmark. The actual theoretical performance of the DRAM is actually 170 gigabytes per second and for, for an aggregate from both sockets of 340 gigabytes per second. That's a 6x jump over what we saw in Titan. Uh, just a traditional uh, SMP bus between the two nodes at 64 gigabytes per second. Uh, nothing too fancy here, but we're hoping that it will reduce some of the NUMA impacts on the system um, that we traditionally see. So one of the, the more special things we, we like about this box and uh, one of the enabling factors is um, it's the first server to market with PCI Gen 4. Um, as far as I know, Intel and AMD um, are a little further out on this. Um, ARM has talked about it, but it's not there yet. 
So what this means is that we can pack more into every single node. Um, it means that we're going to be able to, you know, with PCI Gen 4, these EDR ports would have taken 32 PCI slots. Uh, instead, it's going to sit in a bi bifurcated slot, which means that applications running in either NUMA, NUMA domain are going to be able to access the HCA with almost direct, uh, with very low latency because they don't have to cross the NUMA bus to be able to get down to the system. Um, it, it, we used a virtualized mechanism to be able to achieve this, and so actually manifest in the system as four ports. Uh, we're also able to pack in a BI-8 PM1725A that's going to be used for our checkpointing data. So if we take a look at one of the better systems out there in terms of PCI lanes, we're going to be talking about the AMD EPIC system. The Intels today, I believe, are only going to support around 80 lanes of PCI Gen 3. So in an equivalent system, our HCA by itself would take up 32 lanes. And then if you start thinking about you know, trying to pack GPUs and some of the other things in there, you're not going to really be able to do that. And so uh, this, you know, the expansion to PCI Gen 4 has allowed us to pack more in. It also allows us to do more with the system. Should we choose to upgrade the system in the, in the future to HDR, we have the bandwidth available to get a doubling of our network performance should we choose to go that route. Another pretty special thing that we have in our system is uh, CAPI 2 over the, uh, or it was CAPI 2. Um, in our system, we're using CAPI 2 protocol over PCI Gen 4. And the goal here is to reduce the latency between the host HCA and uh, between the host processor and the HCA. Uh, and I can tell you, um, we, we're expecting really good things here. Again, I'm on the messaging acceptance uh, tests for the actual, like, bringing the systems on there. Part of these are our latency measurements for our HPC applications, and so we run a bunch of latency benchmarks. And we are seeing very, very low latency in our preliminary network measurements on Summit. We're seeing sub-microsecond uh, latencies between nodes for our communication. And part of this has been enabled by the, the, the CAPI, uh, CAPI protocol over PCI Gen 4. The other big thing that this is bringing is address translation services to the participating CAPI devices. And so I'm going to go into a slide in this in a second that's going to explain this better. But through a combination of CUDA-managed memory that comes from the NVIDIA devices, on-demand paging that comes from uh, the Mellanox devices, and address translation services that come from the CAPI, uh, uh, CAPI 2, we're going to be able to access UVM buffers directly from the HCA. And we're going to use this to be able to do what is, looks like essentially true GPU-initiated communication. And so we're, you know, it's coming in spectrum, and it's going to be uh, GPU async direct communication. But our user visible results are going to see significantly reduced latencies and being able to run MPI sends or MPI receives directly from the GPUs themselves and actually have the, the work done by the GPU. And so this is a, a, a figure that's actually been provided to us um, by Robert Blackmore of the Spectrum MPI team. And this is essentially how it works in Spectrum MPI. The CPU is still responsible for setting up the IB descriptors. But it passes this information to the GPU, which then fills up its data buffers to get ready for MPI send. The GPU now has the ability to write the doorbell on the HCA directly. And then through those technology services, those technologies I mentioned, on-demand paging, and address translation services from CAPI 2, we can pull the data off of the GPU to the HCA and put it out on the network for transmission. This is pretty close to GPU-initiated communication. The, the only thing the GPU is lacking is the ability to set up the Q pairs. <clears throat> so finally, I think one of the things that Power provides and is bringing to us that we didn't have before is NVLink 2 to Power 9. And so, um, you guys are all familiar with DGX boxes, the NVIDIA machine learning boxes, with two Intel processors uh, and eight GPUs. And all eight of those GPUs in those boxes are working together over NVLink. 
But what they lack is they lack NVLink up to the host processors. The CPUs are connected by 16 lanes of PCI Gen 3. That means your hosts can only talk to your GPUs at 16 gigabytes per second when they need to move data out there. And that's a bottleneck in the system. In our system, the Power 9 is actually participating in NVLink, which is why we get 150 gigabytes per second from each of our host CPUs to all three of the GPUs that are attached to it. So this is a big deal for us. And so if I go back to that Titan slide I was talking about a few minutes ago, there was five gigabytes per second of PCI bandwidth to the GPU. The impact of this was actually well, well stated a little while ago. We did some analysis on Titan where we took a look at all of the jobs that were ever run on Titan and we took a look at the amount of memory they used. And one of our findings we came back to was there was an uncomfortably high amount of jobs that would use only six gigabytes per node of memory. And if you can't guess, if we go back a couple slides, that was because there was only six gigabytes of a GDDR memory on the GPUs. The pain of moving data back and forth between the host processors and the GPUs were so painful, applications were setting their working set sizes smaller to only fit out of those GPUs. In fact, the ratio of memory performance to PCI performance was 50 to one. With Summit, We've reduced that from 20 to 1. The goal here is to enable applications to use larger working sets than just the GPU memory that sits on board. And I think Jack's talk prior to this did a good job of, of stating that application, application designers are actually starting to look at how we can do this using large working set sizes that are more than just the, the HBM2 we have sitting on our Volta GPUs. So the the other aspect of this is a, is a portability aspect. Um, so since the onset of Titan, which was, um, <clears throat> uh, since, since Titan came in, uh, it was the largest 10 petabyte, it was the first 10 petabyte machine with GPUs installed. And so there was a, a litany of application designers yet that had not ported their codes to GPU. And so we've been in a continual, you know, systematic cycle every year where the number of applications using GPUs are increasing year over year, but we still have applications out there which do not use GPUs on a GPU-enabled machine like Titan. And so with the host participating in NVLink 2, we now get a new ability, um, which we hadn't seen before, which is going to hopefully ease portability. Uh, essentially, the hosts are now able to participate in NVLink 2 address translations and paging services so that pointers referenced on the applications can, uh, pointers created on the host processors can actually be referenced from the uh, NVIDIA GPUs without crashing the application. And so our hope here is that as we're onboarding new GPU applications, that um, it makes it easier for the life of the programmer. Now, this isn't going to be performant, uh, it's mostly going to be a portability or debugging statement, but uh, this should make life a lot easier. So I'll conclude. Um, I'll, I'll tell you from a procurement standpoint, we, when we release an RFP to vendors, we create a set of figures of merit. And as uh, Adam mentioned earlier, we release these benchmarks that are proxies of the applications uh, that we and they run. And one of the most consistent thing, one of the most consistent feedbacks we get from vendors, and what the, some of the most consistent feedback we get from applications is that bandwidth is what gates HPC performance, application performance. Um, and so in this talk, I'm, I'm stating that to mean memory bandwidth, interconnect bandwidth, and internal I.O. bandwidth. And I think if you take a look at uh, what the power architecture is providing uh, with Summit, um, it is providing that bandwidth that we need. We're, we're moving from 270 gigabytes per second, uh, we're moving from 55 to 270 gigabytes per second of DRAM, we're moving from five to 600 gigabytes per second of GPU connectivity, and we're moving to 25 gigabytes per second of interconnect performance from 5.2 gigabytes per second of interconnect performance. All of this put together has allowed us to create the Summit system um, and, and at the same time the Sierra system as well. And I don't have a very neat photo of our system being put out. I actually had those in earlier, but then I was, I was shamed into removing them, so I just have a picture of Summit in the room. Are there any questions?
This was an earlier photo. All right, well, thank you. <laughs>